We are uh, in James chapter 2 tonight. Uh, we did cover uh, one verse last week. For those of you who are not here, it was a great class. Uh, thank you again for your participation. It was a class that I desperately needed. Um, just a particularly heavy week and uh, really just very uplifting to me. So just want to say thank you for that. Um, we have got... Um, I went ahead and put First and Second Peter on here. I realize the task of getting through the rest of James tonight seems rather, um, <laughs> what's the word, presumptuous, yeah, uh, after last week, but I, I think that some of these verses, while they are interesting and, and certainly can spark discussion, are also, I think, pretty straightforward. And so I went ahead and prepared First and Second Peter as well, because that's where we'll be going next. Um, so if... Lord willing, we get there, we get there, and if not, then we, we keep it for another week. We will jump in now to James, um, chapter 2. We're going to just hop right in, verse 14 through 26. This is a bigger passage. There's a few little things that we'll talk about, but kind of one of the main big ideas is this idea that faith without works is dead, that it's not real faith. Starting in verse 14, James says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So the, the first illustration he gives is to imagine a homeless person. Uh, imagine uh, today is a good day for it. It's cold and it's rainy. And a homeless person in the church comes to you. You know about this brother or sister in the church struggling. And you say to them, you know, bless you, praying for you. Go and, uh, and stay warm and stay full. <laughs> and that's it. And you don't give them a jacket or maybe some food. I don't know, some soup, something. Then... James is making the point that your words are very meaningless at this point, right? You can tell someone all day long, be warm, stay filled, and unless you're giving something to them to warm them and to eat, that really is not helpful at all. In fact, it's insulting, right? Uh, it, it is like dead faith or faith that does not have works. Keep reading verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Okay, so uh, this is an interesting verse in and of itself. I figured we'd park here for a second and, and at least address it because it's not one you can just skip over. Even the demons believe and shudder. What do you think James is getting at there? What is he addressing? What is he identifying? Is he uh, identifying the, uh, the fact that, you know, there are people out there that serve a master of the Lord himself? Yeah, yeah. That actually can do works. Right. But... So what James, what James is doing here is he's deconstructing an idea that belief is not merely intellectual acceptance, right? right? That you can believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and that does not make him Lord or Savior over your life. Now, we saw this a lot in the Gospels, uh, when we were in the Gospels. If you remember, there were several times where Jesus addresses demons, and how did they, how did they respond to him? What did they call him? They called him the Son of God. Like, I, I say this a lot, and I'll say it because I think it's a good reminder, especially in Matthew's Gospel, that there are a few groups of people who identify rightly who Jesus is, none of them are Jews, right? It's always either Gentiles or demons. <laughs> Gentiles and demons get it right. Jews always get it wrong. They, they don't see, which is, yeah, the grand irony. It's why Paul says that, that you know, they're a stumbling block to Jews, that this, this idea of Jesus as the Messiah was like a paradigm shift for them. They could not get their minds around it. But demons even understood uh, I think of the, the, the Gerasene demoniac. It's one of the, I think, the most incredible portions of the gospel where Jesus comes to this demon-possessed man, the man of the tombs, if you will. Um, there's a great old song by Bob Bennett. Anyone remember Bob Bennett? 
um, folk Christian singer. Uh, we had him here like 10 years. Yeah, I love, yeah, and he has a song called Man of the Tombs, and, and it's about the Gerasene demoniac. And, and in the story, Jesus comes to him, and the demons immediately recognize who he is. And it's an incredible story for no other reason than Jesus' actions towards the demons. Because if you remember, they cry out, they say, have mercy on us, son of God, son of David, have mercy on us. You know, cast us rather into these pigs than send us back to darkness. And it says that Jesus grants them mercy by doing so. Jesus has mercy on demons. That is profound. When that first occurred to me, I, I was like, I feel like I've never understood this story well. Because it's just unthinkable when you imagine that, but it's what happens. It, it, the story says two things, really three things. That A, the demons know and fear rightly because they know who Jesus is. B, Jesus has the power to immediately uh, send them back to hell. And C, he doesn't. He has mercy on them. It's just, it's profound. So James is capturing this idea that, that demons, that the spiritual powers of darkness are not unaware of who Jesus is. You know, in movies, in, in uh, you know, television, even in books, there, there's always like this sort of grand struggle, this epic struggle between light and darkness and good and evil and this, this, you know, end battle where it's like God and Satan finally engage in the last and final act and there are casualties on every side and, and you know, it's like, but in the end there's like the grand act of goodness and it dispels evil and that's not how the Bible presents this battle at all, right? It's not even a battle. It's, a, it's like a, it's a, a, a boot squashing an ant, right? Like it is nothing when you look at Revelation's account for how Jesus fights the powers of darkness. He comes in, he has a sword coming out of his mouth, he has flames in his eyes, he just destroys them. Like there's not even, it, it, he's the only one fighting. There's not even an army. He just comes in and wrecks shop on all of them. They know, they understand, they are terrified of who Jesus is. Every account terrified of who he is. They know. And knowing, James says, is not believing in a faith salvation sense. So you can understand who he is, and it doesn't make him any more Lord over your life until submission happens. Humility, humbling yourself, right? Confessing before God, seeing the brokenness. It's the illustration I used, uh, when was it, two Sundays ago now, um, about, uh, it was a, an illustration that is very old. Jonathan Edwards developed this idea between the natural and moral ability of man, if you remember that, if you were in church. And, uh, and, and it's the same concept, right, that, that the second man had every natural ability to get up and he understood who the king was. He just wasn't willing to submit to him. And that's exactly kind of the picture that we gather here from what James is saying, is that you can be even a demon and be fully aware, fully believe that Jesus is who he says he is and still not be saved. Any thoughts on that? That's just sort of a side note, but I think it's important to address. Questions? Concerns? And what happened to the pigs after they ran off? The they died. They drowned. Or yeah. the demons in the pigs, whatever. You know, it doesn't say. Um, it doesn't say, so the, uh, bacon for everybody, bacon for everybody. <laughs> except the Jews. Yeah. Yeah. Although they fell in likely salt water, which means they're probably brining still. We might be onto something. We might be onto something. Let's keep reading. Let's see here. Um, verse 20, do you want to be shown you foolish person? that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And Scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works, and not by faith alone. And in the same way, not also Rahab the prostitute, or was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. 
For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Now, here's the interesting (laughs) part. Look at this. Yes, this is good. Your Bible reads to you? I have to read mine. Dang. I update myself. Um, So, the interesting thing about this is that James says something here that can make us a little uncomfortable if we're not careful, right? That he, and it's particularly, he says, uh, where is it at? Uh, call the friend of God, you see the person? Yeah, uh, verse 24. You see that a person is justified, we love that word, by works and not by faith alone. You can just hear Martin Luther turning over in his grave, right? And, um, Paul turning over in his grave. So what are we to make of this? Are we saved by works or are we saved by faith? Saved by faith through grace. Yes. Yes. The thing is, is that the faith but, is there, the works flow on back. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Not our works. Right. So if, if you don't bear fruit, then... It's not really faith. Right. It's, well, I mean, it's not the best to judge that, but that's what God's works is. That's what God's judge. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that we can make a, a, a judgment call on that, not to say that you're going to heaven or hell, but to say, I would call into question the validity of yeah. your faith because Scripture calls us to do that, right? Um, yeah, so the, the, the concept here is that faith in James' uh, context was being presented as something that you just believe, but it has no changing effect on your life, no transforming effect on your life. So yeah, Jesus is Lord, great, right? And then just off to the normal life like I live every day. And what what he's getting at here is that this is not actual faith, that your faith is fully demonstrated. Out of it flows a change in action, a reorienting of the heart which directs our actions, right? And so for the first time, when God redeems us, when we are born again, we are spiritual now. We're not spiritually dead. We're spiritually alive. And we have the capacity for the first time to act according to this new spiritual life that we've been given. So when we see the person struggling, we don't just say like, huh, good luck, right? But we, it's like we all of a sudden we have a burden for those people. We want to see hope be, be given to those people. We want to see uh, a, a transformation happen in their life as well. And so it, it's a, a moving thing. Now, with that being said, there are varying degrees of this. And this is a really, it's a fine line that we tread in the church. We always have to be careful because on the flip side, you will, you will th- this is where the whole idea of law and works, I think, really become important to understand the distinction between. When we say the law, when we talk about the law, and we've had this discussion quite a bit, what we're saying is that these are standards put in place by God for righteous living. So if you want to see the heart of God for humanity, this is what it looks like, right? Don't commit murder. Don't lust. Don't steal. Don't covet. I mean, very basic things. Honor the Lord your God. Don't have any idols. Um, There's a lot of, of ways that that works itself out. With that being said... Jesus comes along and actually shows us the real heart of the Father, that anger is actually murder, that lust is actually adultery, that, that it's much more than just actions, that it's actually a heart issue. And, and the purpose then of the law becomes not just to show us God's standard for living, but to show us how in need of a Savior we really are, that we're really far off. Yeah, we, can't make it. we cannot make it. We, we have no hope of doing this, right? And because we cannot do it perfectly, the law actually condemns us. Because once the bar has been set and you don't get over the bar, you lose, right? So if we're never able to reach the bar, the law dictates where it's at, we're never able to get there, then the law becomes a condemning thing on our lives. So it's a very subtle shift, but understand that It's the difference in saying, you need to do these things in order to be a good Christian versus because God loves you, how will you respond? Because God has redeemed you, 
how are you going to live? How shall we then live? That's kind of the famous quote, right? Um, it, it's very subtle because in one, the bar is already set and I will never fully get there. So I will always be reminded of the fact that I am not enough. And that law, law-driven churches beat people down. They get weary. They get tired. It's why I believe that church attendance and Christianity at large has declined in the last 25 to 30 years because overall or overarchingly we have promoted law not gospel we've said if you want to be a good christian uh, boy or girl better not kiss anybody right better be a virgin until you get married well i mean how many like how many kids think god hates them by the time they're in high school you know what i'm saying and, and not to not to say that those are things that they shouldn't do but there's a way of communicating that that says that this is really about you. It's about the quality of your life. It's about what God desires for you, not reaching the bar. Because the moment you don't reach it, the moment you're kind of cast away forever. And that's just one of many examples. You can't say bad words. Oh, you have a Metallica CD. You know, you should burn it at youth camp. Otherwise, you know, the Holy Spirit is going to leave you. I mean, it's like, it's, it's just the insane... Have you ever heard that, that like when you burn a Metallica CD, you can hear the demons hissing? Right? I'm like, stop, just please, just please stop. That is not, it's the plastic, all right? Yes. We went to a Bill Gopper, and I went to Bill years ago, and they were kind of going down that road, you know, so we went home and we had all these records, and we were smashing. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, now we're going, oh my gosh, why did we do that? <laughs> Wait, those were... I had some Christian friends in high school that you know that, that were going to churches with me, and I was like, "Don't like give them, just give them to me, give them to the center. I'll take them." You know, I love that man. Uh, yeah, it's just so if you say faith without works is dead, work can you? Is it also like works? I'm trying to think how the hell. I guess what do you know, or how do you how do you evaluate? And is this just works that I'm doing, or is this or is this coming from a place of faith? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that that question has to be asked like every day, right? That, that we always should be examining our motives for why we do things. Yeah. Always. Because, I mean, you get to a point, it's, it's not like you get to a point where all of a sudden I figured out like, I know how to serve now out of total faith. Like, it just doesn't happen on this side of, of heaven. And there are constantly times where I look at the things that I'm doing, the things that I, I mean, even down to, to classes and curriculum and, and everything where I'm like, am I still doing this for the right reasons, you know? Um, and like, you know, I, I, it's easy now, but I imagine this is the struggle that, that pastors, preachers get when there starts to be a huge level of notoriety, when like people are asking you to write books you know, you have to start to ask the question, like, am I doing this for the accolades or am I doing this because this is what God's called me to do? Um, and that's like on a big level, I think just on a day-to-day -day level, and, and I would highly encourage this. This is, it seems like a weird sort of sub trail to go off of on this conversation, but uh, we offer a freedom group here called uh, Conquering Codependency. And uh, I'm, I'm in the group right now on Tuesday mornings, uh, men's group, and I'm not, like, I do not identify as a codependent at all, um, but I love fellowship with guys. I love the process, and so I thought, I'll go in here, and there's a lot of tools that I'm, I'm learning from this workbook that are super helpful, even as someone who doesn't really identify in this way, but it's one of the things that, that we've talked about a lot in that class so far that you have to really check your motives, especially in relationships. You know, am I doing these things for approval? Am I doing these things to hold power over someone? Am I doing these things to endear someone to me? I would say those are wrong motives. Um, you know, am I doing these things because it's what God has called me to do? That's kind of where you want to find yourself. And, and I think that you can be in a really good track of, of hearing the voice of God and walking according to the Spirit and being obedient, and then all of a sudden find yourself in a position where you are tempted to act for impure motives. So it's a question that should always be asked, I believe. Um, anyone, anyone have any experience with that? I mean, anyone, if you do, then I'd love to hear it. I, that's my experience. I can be in a great track. It's kind of like, it's, it's kind of a funny, it's kind of like dieting, right? Like I'll have like three weeks of like, man, I'm doing so great. 
And then like one night I find myself with Taco Bell. And I'm like, how did this happen? I love it, but how did it happen, you know? Um, you have to be vigilant every day. Um, I do, so. What? Temptation, yeah. Why do you think they're kind of going back to your records? Yeah. This isn't legalistic, but I know that there are certain types of songs I've watched people actually change before my eyes, like mm -hmm. listening to rap music yeah. incites a lot of hate, yeah. incites a lot of um, violence. It does. So I think there's a, there's a guard that we have to place on our mind and our heart it, to respect it, some of those things. Yes, but here's the, here's the, the key there, because I agree with you, but here's the key is I have to have a guard and a filter from my mind and heart. I don't necessarily need to have one for yours. Because there are, there are, there are times where, like, like heavy metal, right? Um, heavy metal does nothing to me. Like it doesn't make me a rage monster. I have friends who do. Like they listen to it and they're like angry. They wanna fight people. I listen to it and I'm just like, man, that's great musicianship. Look at how well the drum, you know I mean? Like it just doesn't do that to me. Now, obviously when you get into like, extreme profanity and it, then you need to ask a separate question which is like all things are lawful but is this profitable right i don't know that i should be engaging myself in this so i think there's a lot of levels of questions but i think this is where churches have gotten it a little wrong is someone has a negative experience to a song a band a movie and they're like this is bad for christians and maybe it is for a lot of them but maybe it's not, and it becomes very dogmatic in a bad way when that happens. So I think speaking out of experience, like, you know, and uh, something we talk about on Tuesday mornings as well, it's my experience that when I listen to this kind of music, it doesn't do good things for my mind. That's, a, that's a, I think, a helpful thing to say in a group of, of Christians, because it may be that they relate to that. It may be that they don't, but it's a good way of engaging the conversation without laying down absolute laws where the scriptures may be not absolutely clear. So, and once again, that's a fine line. Things like, like you, know, um, you know, sexual immorality or things that are obviously problematic. Um, you know, we won't make pornography. You know, no one would make a case, well, it doesn't bother me, doesn't affect me. Like, it doesn't matter, it's a sin, right? So there is a level of that, but I think when it begins being brought to these more broad, these more broad generalities, it can create problems and maybe not be the most effective way. Does that make sense? Yeah. I've, seen, I've seen that really create problems for people, that, that kind of thing. You talk about your mind, and, and when the Word talks about let this mind be in you that is in Christ. Right. So we're being transformed, and we're yes. conforming to yes. the things of God and His Word. And so there are certain guards that I place on my life no doubt. in order to live the way I think He's called. And, and absolutely, absolutely should. There are things that I don't listen to that, that I mean, are not even, they have nothing, it's not even a, um, there are lots of albums that I, I will not listen to at all, and not because they're profane, because they're really not, not because they're like incite violence, because they don't. I have just linked them so heavily with sinful past behavior that like when I hear it, I'm like, I just, I can't even like, it just, it's like, it reminds me of a very dark time in my life. So I don't listen to it. But I would never say like, none of you should listen to this band anymore. You know, I mean, it's like, it's fine. It's just, there, it's associated with things. And I think this is how the enemy works a lot of the times where he understands things that, that trip you up, things that get at you. And we're all different. We all have different little, uh, you know, tendencies. We all have different pasts. And so sometimes things that are used against me may not be effective against you. And, uh, and so I have to guard myself against things that probably some of you don't, uh, and vice versa. And then there are things, once again, that we should all guard ourselves against. I just think that that, is, that has to be clear from the scripture, if that makes sense. It is a really good point, though. I mean, you are exactly right that you are, what you allow in is doing something to you whether you realize it or not. So, that is a good point. Aren't God-centric works, I'll call it that, <coughs> works that flow out of yeah. gratitude for what God has done for you yeah. seem to me to be uh, synonymous with uh, 
the church word sanctification, but basically your spiritual maturity. Yeah. The growth of your spiritual maturity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and the more you grow toward developing the character of yeah. Christ, probably, I mean, you can't judge, I, I wouldn't judge anybody by this, but I, I think that, you know, you're, the, the works that you produce that, that flow out of God working in you and through you. One of, the things, one of the things I say a lot is that, like, I am less interested in, when I'm getting to know people and I'm, I'm trying to discern, like, what, how serious are they about this? I am far less interested in morality than I am your awareness of your lack of it. Uh, that's good. That's good. Can you say that again. Like I, I'm far more interest, far less interested in your morality than I am your awareness of your lack of it. It's it's people who like have it all together and doing great things that make me super uncomfortable. I'm like, I, you seem way too perfect for me. <laughs> you know, uh, there's something under the hood that ain't right. I'm sure of it. You know, but people who like are very like comfortably imperfect. And not like that they want to stay there. I mean, they love Jesus. They want Jesus to mend them, <clears throat> but they don't try to hold it back. I mean, they're just like, this is who I am. You know, but I love Jesus, but I cuss a little kind of people. I'm, I'm like that, like, I think you, you're on to it more than the other because it, it is like that. I think awareness of sin is one of the biggest marks of Christian maturity. And, and it's one of the biggest acts of obedience when we confess it, as we're going to find out here uh, at the end of James, that this is a command of God. It's not, even, it's not even like a good thing you should maybe do sometimes. It will command it to. Confess your sins. Pray for one another. This is how God does His restorative process in your life. So, you know, that, that's just been my experience, is that the whole concept of morality is like, I, I'm not interested in seeing how moral you are. I know you're not perfectly moral. I know it because the Bible says it. <laughs> you know, I want to know how in touch with that you are. Because if you're in touch with it, then it means that you're, you are listening to the Spirit and you are allowing God to work in your life. There was a question over here a minute ago. That, well, I was going to ask. Yeah. Um, I was going to take a step in a different rabbit trail. Yeah. Thief on the cross. Mm-hmm. You know, you obviously there's moments away from death. Right. That testified on behalf of Jesus. Right. You know, versus the other one that, that didn't. That didn't. Yeah. I mean, that demonstrated faith, obviously. It did. What works. His yeah. testimony. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, his his willingness, and that's why I think we can get into to like cutting into places we shouldn't necessarily that we're not intended to go. It's not that like if you, yeah, like deathbed confessions. But isn't you that know, a picture of a true motivation? I think so. Because here's a thief on the cross that's, you know, taking their last few dying breaths right. and still motiva- motivated to, to say something, speak up and say something yeah. that Jesus has done. By the way, the thief on the cross verse is like one of the least liked verses for Church of Christ people. Because they believe you have to be baptized to be saved. Yeah. And Jesus is like, I'm going to see you in paradise in just a little while. And guess who doesn't get baptized, right? Yeah. That guy. So uh, uh, they're, they're not a big fan of that one. Uh, not their favorite verse in the Bible. Was there a question over here a minute ago? Back here? It was a random thought. It was connected to something that's lost. It's gone. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Sorry we killed your thought. My bad. I'll say one more thing. I think this is fascinating. Um, there is a... A, a concept in um, the first great awakening um, that was developed by some of the theologians during that time, disinterested, sorry, apparently can't talk and write at the same time, uh, faith, disinterested faith. Um, not disinterested doubter, um, it's always where I want to go, but disinterested faith. Uh, this was coined by some of the conservative new light theologians that said that true saving faith should be faith that is focused not on what God has done for me, but just on who God is. 
So um, the fear here for some of these guys in the awakening where revivals were happening constantly and revival preaching is very much centered on the fact that you are a sinner but that God has made a way for you and that if you will believe by faith, you can right now be snatched out of the fires of hell and into eternal life. I mean, this is the kind of things that they would say. And some of these guys thought this preaching, this theology is too central on what God does for me and not just on the goodness of who God is alone. And so they would say that one of the ways you can know that your faith is, is sound is if you were more interested in God than you were yourself. That you didn't think as much about the, the grace given to you as much as just the beauty and the glory of who God is in and of himself. And so, you know, I've, I've kind of been thinking about that, like wrestling with that. Like what, and, and I understand what they're going for. I think that we can major too much on like, hey, what do I get out of this? Right? That's the wrong kind of gospel presentation. Um, but on the other hand, we are told to rejoice, to have shouts of joy, that God picked me up out of the, the pit and out of the mire, the muck and the mire, and that you know, he, has, he has redeemed me from the flame and from the mouth of the lion. And he's, so there is tons of scripture that, that account for glorifying and praising him for what he has done for me, Right? Um, but I think there is something to this, though, of this, this concept that is helpful for us in our modern context to think about, that it, does my faith, does my love for God focus purely on what I have gotten out of this deal, or do I see the beauty of God? Do I behold the beauty of Christ as something that is to be cherished in and of itself? And I think that's a, a great question to ask. Kind of another one of those little pieces that yeah. But I think you can still get there in that kind of path if you're thinking about what he has done for me because of who he is. No doubt. Yeah. I Not think because of anything. Absolutely. Or anyone else. Yes. No, and I, I agree with you. I'm, I, I think this is a little too far, right? Um, and even some of them would say that it's okay to rejoice in what God has done for you. But I, I think it's a good question for us to ask. Not necessarily that we should be here on the full other side of the extreme, but that there is more to loving God than just seeing everything He's done for me, right? At the end of the day, like I have to decide. Well, actually, still, still the yeah, yeah, absolutely. And well, and that was—I mean—that was kind of the point of night of worship on Sunday night. Yeah. Is just be still, shut up, <laughs> and and. Uh, and, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I, Kelsey and I have talked about this uh, a lot this week because we had just a lot of really great feedback. And what it says to me pastorally is that our people need rest more than I think we sometimes realize. When, like, the highlight of the week was we got to sit down and do nothing. And it was awkward and it was uncomfortable for me personally and it was the best thing I ever experienced. I mean, I had someone say that. You know, um, that says to me that... that we're on the right track. Amen. It was a good reminder for me too that the same will put things in front of us that cause us distractions from being still. Yep. And, you know, we just, there's so many apps that cause you to check back in. And that's their whole purpose is just to have them so you're checking in on it and looking at things that aren't important. No doubt. No doubt. Any other thoughts on that? Look, your sanctification process pathway is different than my sanctification process. Mm -hmm. So we may be all winding up at the same place, but we took different paths to get there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, mine is much easier. I wouldn't want anybody to go <laughs> way out. <laughs> oh, man. I agree. I agree. Any other thoughts before we move on? No controversy yet. I need the, I need the questions. I'm just kidding. Let's look at chapter 3. Chapter 3. Taming the tongue. Woo. Woo -hoo -hoo. All right. Verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Okay, so... Uh, 
Don't be a teacher, you guys. Uh, moving on. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I mean, seriously, this is, a, this is a, 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 a teaching that's not just found in Peter. Paul addresses this in, in some ways as well, that, that teachers, people who teach the Bible, are uh, held to a higher standard. There's a stricter judgment. Uh, Paul talks a lot about how, you know, I proclaimed faithfully the gospel to you, and so that the blood is not on my hands for the way you've acted. I've done my part. I have shared the truth. I have no part in, you know, I spoke against the things you were doing, and you're still doing them, so I've, I'm clean here. It's kind of the, the way. I, I think so, but I, I think that, um, I don't know that that's exactly what he has in mind here. I think what he has in mind here is someone who, on a, you know, regular or semi-regular basis, is unfolding the Scripture and teaching for the sake of pushing people into action. So teachers, preachers, um, Bible study leaders that are, and, and like this is even kind of one of the things that we do differently in our church, which a lot of churches do this. Um, I do the work for the teachers, right? I mean, you still need to prepare and you still need to do the, the work to understand it, but, but you know, the, the lesson plans are put together. I'm, I'm doing the, the heavy lifting, um, and, and the reason why he says that, if you keep reading, this is why there's a greater strictness. Verse 2, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If you put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. So, I mean, if you've had any you know, history of riding horses, you know that the thing that go in the mouth of horses, if you pull one side or the other, it directs their whole body. That's kind of the illustration he's using here. Um, he says, look at the ships also. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. So the person is guided by the tongue, by what they say or what they don't say. So what is the connection to teachers here? Why does he go from, not many of you should teach, to bridling the tongue? There's some people that you and take away from the Lord God and people stray just by their position on glory. That's why we're supposed to study. Yes. To show our own self approval. Right. No doubt. The teachers are leaders too. I mean, just like the, the rudder or the, the pit to horse. Yes, he's directing. And I would even take it a step further in saying that that it is true that teachers who add or take away for the sake of misleading is absolutely in the mind of Peter. But to go even further, teachers who are just careless, who just don't study much, who, who have a positional authority over a group of people, who exercise positional authority in teaching, but just kind of wing it. They're held accountable for things they say, not having really prepared, right? They, if, if, if I got up here and started teaching out of a book that I had hardly looked at or studied and just started saying whatever it was that came to my mind, anything that is of error, I'm accountable for, which is why I, I spend a lot of time, and I pretty much commit Wednesday to this class. Um, it's not, it doesn't usually always take me a whole day, it's depending on where I'm at and what book I'm at. Some of these books I've spent a lot of time in, so I can feel pretty confident in just kind of looking over past work, but... Um, some of these books that we've covered in here are books that I have not spent as much time in. I spent a little bit of time in them, but I, I needed to really drill down and make sure that I was on something because I don't want to stand up here and say a bunch of stuff that just sounds really good and I'm not really convinced of myself, A, and B, because I'm going to be held accountable for it. And I don't want that either. So, yeah, he's, he's making a connection here that teachers guide with the tongue by what they say, by their speaking. And... Uh, if you're perfect, you can perfectly bridle your tongue, but nobody's perfect. So there's going to be errors. I think the Lord's really serious about that, too, because I would also attribute it to when he talks about not, not doing anything, and I would say that would be saying anything, too, to call something little, one, little yeah. ones. Little ones. The ones that are still on the milk, yep. you know, feeding, just learning the word, yep. to cause one of the little ones to stumble. In their relationship with the Lord. It'd be better to be thrown, thrown into, into the, the ocean. depths of the sea than to cause one of them 
Yeah. That's how careful, that's what. That's the accountability that you're talking about, that you trust that you're giving his little ones yes. true milk. Yes. To cause them to grow to me. Absolutely. Well, and there's a lot, too, when you read the New Testament and even the Old Testament. Um, but particularly, I mean, we're going to see some here. We've already seen a lot of it in Paul's letters that when you talk about the things that we are to put away as Christians, go through and look at those lists and ask the question, how many of those things are accomplished by the mouth? There are a lot of them. <laughs> There's a lot of them, right? A lot of things that we're warned against or told to put away are speech oriented um you know i mean there's we could go on and on and on out of the mouth you know reveals the contents of the heart so the mouth is a an important part of biblical theology not just in peter or in james rather but in uh and i keep saying peter because we're going to be there next um not in just james but in in all the scripture there's value in what we say and what we do not say. Um, there is the passage in the Old Testament, I can't think off the top of my head where, but um, where it talks about, maybe Micah, where it talks about that, you know, someone who is being convicted unright, un, unrighteously or unjustly, and you know that it's, it's not right and you don't speak up, the lack of speaking is sin. Um, so sometimes it's a lack of speech, like I think was what you were referencing a moment ago. Um, yeah, it's important. God cares about justice. And often justice is, is forged. Is loose lips sink ships. Yeah. They also sink relationships. They do. No doubt. No doubt. All right, uh, keep going. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. He's going to continue. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. I mean, think of the slap in the face that is to us. We can tame any animal there is on earth, and we can't even tame our own tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a, trig fee, a, a, can, a, blah, blah, blah. can a fig tree, my brothers, I was not speaking in tongues, by the way, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Yeah, there's a contradiction here. This is, James is giving insight to why Paul says, put away malice, put away slander. Slander is a major issue in the heart of God. I mean, don't water it down. It's a major issue in the heart of God. And, and what he's saying is when slander happens from the mouth of a Christian, it is a contradiction on every level. How can you in one, in one way bless the Lord and curse your brother from the same source? What does that say? What does that indicate? Now, once again, I want to be real careful not to paint a picture that like if you've ever slandered one person, you don't love God and you're not a Christian. It's not what I'm saying. There's a reason why the New Testament tells us to put these things down actively, put them away, right? Um, James is, is making a pretty clear case here, though, that it's not, it doesn't jive. It's a contradictory uh, thing to do. So any other thoughts on that one? It's a trigger for unforgiveness. Yes. I don't like him, so I got to get him. Yeah. I haven't forgiven for whatever I thought they did right. or didn't or did do. Right. So I gotta I gotta make it sure it hurts. So yep. they won't do it again. Right. Stay off that to get rush hour. You don't much to me. My gosh, you are you are uh, preach. Preach. 
I'm like, Lord, I, I need to play the worship music this morning. I go to take my kids to school every morning. And I have to go through UTA traffic. And oh, my Lord, I need the sanctifying process. <laughs> no, 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 thank you. Any other thoughts on that one? Let's keep looking. Keep looking. James 4, 13 through 17. This is a good one. So this will just warm you up. This is a great morning devotional. If you ever want to wake up, get a great start in the spirit, read James 4, 13 through 17. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. And so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So obviously being facetious about the morning devotional. James is like, you are dew that is on the grass in the morning and it is gone in the morning. <laughs> well, that's two times now the less the week. I know. Yeah, but, but it, it's, it's, it's true, isn't it? That life is fleeting. It, it is not guaranteed. It's like vapor. It is, you can't even grasp it. You can't even grab it. You know it's there. You can kind of see it, but before you know it, it's gone. And you're not even sure why, right? And what is he getting at here? What is he making the, the case for? I think what James is saying is that the way we orient our lives, the way we plan for things, should be yielded to the will of God. So we talked about this several weeks ago, the will of God, uh, and I, I mentioned, uh, I, I like Blackaby's definition of this in Experiencing God, where he says, you know, identify, find where God is working, and join him there. I think that's a great definition for God's will. Um, I think the idea that, that we should just get up and plan our lives and do whatever it is that we feel like would be good for us without any thought at all that God might have a different plan for us is going to be pretty problematic for you. And so constantly consulting God through prayer and, uh, and ascertaining His will through wise counsel is super important because you may have an idea of what is good and you may approach the throne of grace and hear from God that maybe this is not the best thing. Or you may have people in your life that bear witness to that and say, you know what, I, I don't know that that's the best thing for you. And there's something to that. There's something to that. Any thoughts on that one? Kind of a bummer, I know. Sorry. I didn't write it. I just reported. it. Could you go back to the find where God is working and join him there? Where, was, where did that come from? It's, it's Blackaby's definition. It's not, a, it's not in the Bible like in that way, but it's kind of observing the Scripture of just identifying where God is working. It's, it's probably... I haven't... I don't remember if he gives a, a, like a biblical root for where he gets this definition. If I were guessing, it would be in the book of Acts. When Paul is uh, on his missionary journey, he is deciding that he is going to go someplace to share the gospel. And the Spirit's like, don't go there. You're going over there. And he's like, okay. And he just, you know, and he goes. Um, right. And it's like he had a plan, but God's will is like, no, I'm working over there. I want you over there. And so he goes. Uh, but yeah, it's Experiencing God. It's by uh, Henry and Richard Blackaby. It's a fantastic book. Going back to the thing we talked about a couple weeks ago about the Lord's Prayer saying, praying for God's will to be done. So, do you kind of see, I mean, do you see, you know, like examples of like David, you know, did, doing attacking army this way one time and then saying, well, oh God, what should I do this time? And it was completely different the next time. And so, you know, you, you think about all the daily things that you make decisions on. Should I buy this car? Should I go here? Should I do, you know, do you think that there's a, an argument for saying, you know, God, what is your will? And he's a little, he, he, every little individual decision I make throughout the day. No. And here's why. Um, that's a great question. The reason I don't is because if that is the takeaway, then it reveals that I'm reading David's life or the Old Testament as a mirror to my life, and it's not. Um, nor is that the point of those books. The point of those books is to show how God operated in this example. 
with the king of Israel. And oftentimes, when you read those stories with David and even after that with, with different people, um, the attacks on neighboring pagan cities, peoples, are nothing short of ridiculous. Like, go in the field at night and put a candle in a vase, and on my count, throw and break the vase, and the light will make them think that there are all these people. Like, it is the worst war strategy on earth. <laughs> and that's the point of it, is that it works. And so they come, uh, they come out of battle, and they're like, Yahweh is king. Like, surely he directs everything, because this would never work if we had come up with this on our own, and, and we just won this war. And we should have been beaten handily, because they got way more people than us. And so I think that that's the takeaway, is that, is that, look, if you will do what God says to do, even when it doesn't make sense, if God is the author behind it, then it's going to work, because God will not fail. So... Now, to translate that in my own life, the way I would look at that is if I feel the impression of the Spirit on my life to do something that seems like a step in faith, then I ought to really consider, with wise counsel, taking that. I'm not the king of Israel. I'm not going to attack a foreign nation. The Bible's not describing my life, right? So I think that that's one of the things that, it's, it's kind of the same thing that we do sometimes with the Gospels and Acts where like in, in charismatic churches are notorious for this, they love the book of Acts, right? Because the spirit's just haywire, like doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And, and so it's like the book of Acts shows us how the Holy Spirit should operate today. And I would say that is not true at all. Um, he can act that way, but Acts is a description of how God acted. It is not, this is what you should expect from me every time from here on out. And that is demonstrated by the fact that he does things in the early part of Acts that he doesn't do in the later part of Acts. So he does things with David in his early life that he doesn't do in his later life. Um, you know, did he change his mind? Is he sending mixed signals? No, he just, there were just different experiences that, that were demonstrating different things about him. But if you kind of want to, like, though, in the, all the, I guess maybe the example of David wasn't exactly what I meant, but just, like asking for God's will in various things throughout just daily life. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So hear me when I say that. I think that's a good practice. But I don't know that I would say like, you, you just have to kind of figure out like where the limits are with that, right? You know, <laughs> to come full circle, when you're at Taco Bell, right? <laughs> Does God desire me to have beans or chicken tonight? You know? Uh, yeah, I mean, but it's all chicken. Yeah, just pick one. Yeah, just just yeah. it's all chicken. Well, and and but you know, and I, we laugh, but like there are like hyper zealous movements that advocate for this kind of thing, right? Where it's like every decision has to be like a, a movement of the Lord. I'm like, I promise you, He does not really even want you eating there, right? But if if you're gonna ask Him His opinion, He doesn't care, right? Get the chalupa. That's fine. Just whatever is available. I mean. It's not, it's, not a, it's not important, unless there's some like, very specific thing he's doing. I'm not... it, it, it escalates more to the, the larger decisions in your life. And... Yeah, because like I said, you know, when we talk about the will, like kids who go to college, this is a great example. It's like kind of the classic example. You know, should I go to TCU or TCC? You know, I mean, like my initial thought is like, go to TCC. You know, unless God is like calling you for a like intensely spiritual reason. And he does that from time to time. I think mean, there was some, some sharing in, in this class about that. And, and like law enforcement, I think you brought that up as well, that God directed you to that thing. He absolutely can do that. But I think the point that I made with you was that I'm not sure that it would have mattered if he did it here or in Nebraska or in New York. I think the point is God was calling you to a specific trade, a specific call or duty. Um, and so, you know, is there potential for kingdom work? Yes. Is it a wise decision? <laughs> and you have to weigh that. For me, TCU, not a wise decision, right? Because I, I, didn't, I didn't have the, the, re, the, the funds to do that. Um, so, I mean, if those answers are yes, then yeah, go to, I mean, go wherever. But if it's like, 
I want to go here or here, but this place is completely far away from any community or family I know. There's no real Christian fellowship here. There's not many solid churches around. Then I would say, like, that's a pretty clear no to me because God's not working there very much to set you up for one another life. Now, if you're a missionary and God's calling you out there, then go. It's a different story. College, not so much. Did you have a question back here? Yeah. No. No. Okay. Um, does that help? Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, and, and once again, I, I want to say this super clearly. God, I believe very much, speaks to us in our context from time to time for very specific reasons. And, and if, you, if you were out here for our discussion on like prophecy and how that works, um, because I do believe it works. I believe it is an active gift, um, not in the way you probably think if you weren't in this class, so go back and watch the video. Um, but I do think that there are impressions that the Holy Spirit puts on our lives, and it is our job to discern through not only the Spirit within us, but within the community of faith that we exist in, whether or not it really is the Spirit speaking, or if it was just bad Taco Bell I had last night. You know? <laughs> I'm just going to keep going back. It's a joke that never dies. Um, so with that being said, if God directs you to do something really specifically, then I am not saying for one second that he's not doing that. He might be. Um, but I've also seen that taken to an extreme where like, God is certainly probably not directing every single decision that you make. Um, you know, shorts or pants today? I don't know that matters. I really don't. <laughs> I think he's more interested in you pursuing the kingdom of God than whether you're wearing corduroy or khaki, if that makes sense. Any other thoughts on that? No? Good. Wow. All right. Are you skipping the part on chapter 3, the last part? <coughs> wisdom? Gonna... Let's see here. But wisdom is... Where did I skip stand? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works and the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Yeah, thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, if I hadn't been run off on so many rabbit trails, I would have probably... No, but seriously, it's a great, it's a great passage because, I, once again, the imagery is so, I think, profound and rich. James is saying that heavenly spiritual wisdom is like this thing that is coming down from heaven. Like, you can almost think of it as rain. Right? But the, the kind of wisdom that leads to selfish ambition, that leads to uh, all of the bad things that he just described, um, it's not just worldly or immoral wisdom, it's demonic. That is strong. I mean, James does not hold back here. You know, the, the tongue that slanders and tears down is set on fire by hell. Bitter ambition and jealousy, demonic. I mean, he is not even mincing words here. And I think that's important for us to hear. I think it's important for us to get at. James Reeves one time made a comment from the stage that I thought was just like so profoundly gut-wrenching in a great way. But I'll never forget, he said, whenever you lie or deceive, you are never more like Satan than in that moment. Because Satan's the father of lies. And I thought, man, that is a, a strong statement, and it is true. And it is true, and it is sobering, and it's necessary to hear that and to think that, that, that it, you're like Satan when you lie, that you are, de- you are being influenced by demons when you act this way, that when you slander, hell is what is motivating your language. It's sobering, it sh- it, it, and it's meant to be. It's meant to shock you when you hear it, to, to go like, oh, you know, I just thought I had a bad day. You know, I thought I was just riled up listening to Metallica, whatever, you know, but, but no, and it's like, but no, Satan and his demons and hell are motivating this kind of behavior. 
It's a lot more serious. A lot more serious. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate that. That's, that's one of my favorite verses in James, just because that imagery is so, I think, so awesome. And I love that last verse, you know, and, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Once again, the value of peace within Christian community, Christian relationships is very, very high, high premium there. Okay, so moving on to five then, uh, one through six. <laughs> this is where we come back to these particular rich people in James' context that were very unkind and immoral. He says this, starting in verse one, "'Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. No, he comes right after him. Now, apparently what had happened is that these particular people uh, who were very wealthy and, and very self-indulgent had hired day laborers, probably vagrants or sojourners, typically aliens at this time, uh, in this day. This is the kind of work that they were relegated to, and they depended on it to survive because they had nothing else. And James is saying, you hired all these people to come and do your work, and you didn't even pay them and the harvest is crying out against you. The Lord of hosts hears what's happening. Yeah, it has not been kept from him. You thought you got away with it, but you didn't. And all the things that you treasured in this life are turning to absolute garbage, and they're going to consume you like fire. Yikes, yikes. That's, uh... So I, I, I brought the point up earlier, uh, a couple weeks ago, I think, how does James feel about rich people? Uh, I think that's the answer. Um, just for a little bit of Old Testament uh, context here, you don't have to flip here if you don't want, but if you feel uh, like you want to, then I always welcome it. Leviticus 19, 13 is likely what James has in mind here in this passage about the harvest. Uh, I think it's always good to just kind of situate you in the Old Testament because these are the scriptures that James and the authors of the New Testament were reading. Uh, 1913, you shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. He's like, don't even hold it back overnight. You pay them the day of. You make sure that they are compensated for what they have done for you. Um, so this is not just James kind of pulling out a context that just seems mean, it's, it's actual moral code in the Old Testament, in the Torah, Leviticus 19.13. Uh, let's do a couple more. We can maybe finish James, and then we'll see. Um, James 5.11. I threw this in here just because, once again, I, I do these kinds of verses because I think it's important for you to see how the Bible operates within itself. I, I think it's easy to think about the Bible as like this combination of a bunch of books that have to do with different things and when you can see them kind of cross-pollinate with one another it makes the story much more vibrant and much more believable uh, verse 11 behold we consider those blessed who remain steadfast but you have heard of the steadfastness of job and you've seen the purpose of the lord how the lord is compassionate and merciful uh, i just think that's an important verse to point out because it indicates that james valued and saw authority in the book of job um, now we believe the book of job is authoritative it's in the bible but here's one of the reasons why because the the writers of the new testament thought it was authoritative enough to use it as an example so i just think that's fascinating i think it's important to point those out when when we can uh, 13 through 18 is anyone among you suffering let him pray is anyone cheerful let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. 
Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So James is bringing out several things here. The premise or the the kind of main point is that prayer is vitally important to the life of Christians, and it is effective. It is effective for you just as it was for Elijah. He takes one of the most extreme examples in the Old Testament of praying for it to not rain for three and a half years, and he's like, Elijah wasn't any different than you or I. He had a sin nature. He was no different. Prayer is effective. Now, we don't, once again, he's just gotten done talking about the will of God and, and falling into the will of God and how this, how this all works together is, is very difficult to understand. It's, it's a mystery. We know that nothing happens apart from the will of God. If God did not will for it to rain three and a half years, he would not have answered Elijah's prayer. There were lots of things Elijah did that did not work out well, right? Um, the point is, is that if we are walking in line with, in harmony with the Spirit of God, asking for the will of the Father and, 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 and leaning into the will of the Father, then as we pray, those things typically move in the direction that they are meant to move in. It's like what Jesus says, you know, whoever, um, what is it? Whoever has my words and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and whoever loves me will be loved by the Father. And he goes on and he says something like, you know, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. It's in John. Um, and, you know, it's like we look at that and we're like, ask whatever you wish and God will grant you. And it's like, but yeah, but what's the context there? That his words are in you, that you're obedient that you're walking with him, that there's intimacy there, that you're discerning his will for your life and then praying for those things. Those are the things that are done. You, you don't get whatever you want apart from the premise. It's the premise promise concept. And so I think this is what James unfolding here, but he's making the point that like, hey, prayer is, it works. It, it's, a, it's an important thing. And so if anyone is sick, anoint him with oil. Ask for God to heal him. God can do incredible things through regular broken people like us. Does he always? No, he doesn't say he always will. He says he can. So it's a it's something that we practice here. I mean, I I say this a lot, and it's an uncomfortable prayer. I'll say this: like you want to know the most uncomfortable prayer to pray, in a group of people, especially, is when you are praying for healing for someone who is sick, and you say, "Father, it is our heart. We desire more than anything else for you to heal this person. But your will be done." That's a hard prayer to pray, because it's like, what if his will is not to heal? Then we'll praise him all the more. Isn't that, good? Isn't that kind of contrary to the demonstration of what Jesus did? In what way? Jesus came and healed mm-hmm. all that were sick. Yeah. He healed those that were oppressed. Right. right. If he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, yes. then his will yeah. is to heal. Yeah. So well, to say, you know, I, I understand that you can be healed in this earth or beyond. You're not going to step into heaven ill right. or broken. I understand that. But we, using our faith, acting on his word, are instructed by him to lay hands upon the sick yeah. that they shall be healed. So I think there's a measure of our faith, don't you, that we have to put into place doing what he said. Yeah, I mean, I think it is is as far as being obedient to that. The laying on of hands thing, I have to think about a little bit. Here we're told to anoint with oil, elders anoint with oil and pray. It's a little different. It's kind of a departure from what the the Jesus and the disciples do. I think if you think about what Jesus is doing in the Gospels as not so much giving an expectation for what we are to have here, but as him ushering in the kingdom of heaven, that it's a taste, as Peter says, in Acts 2, the quote from Joel, that it's a, it's a taste, it's like a, it's an, a down payment, that this is just like if you've been around and you've seen enough to know this is what the kingdom is like. The kingdom has no sickness. There are no lepers. There is no crippled. There is nothing. It, it, we are made whole and complete. But we're not in the kingdom right now. We're ushering the kingdom in, but the kingdom doesn't come until his millennial reign, until the new heavens and the new earth. And we have heavenly bodies. So I think that 
it, it, really it really depends a little bit on, I get what you're saying, and I do think there is a measure of, like, we need to believe that God can heal. I do think that. I guess, I guess, what, I'm, I guess what I'm referring to is the praying, if you want to heal this person, whatever your will is. But I think, I think, I think when I look at the Word, mm -hmm. and I see the heart of God, mm -hmm. and the character of God, yeah. and the manifestations of God through Jesus and what he did on this earth and Jesus said, so has the Father sent me, I'm now sending you. Yeah. That I see the character of God. Yeah. I see the will. He, he doesn't, it's not his desire that any should perish. Right. You know, the final decision is his, but we need to position ourselves on behalf of whoever is being afflicted. So I, so I, I distinguish a difference between desire and will one of the things that I, I kind of break down. So I believe God desires that everyone be saved. He does not will everyone be saved because not everyone's saved. The word will in the Bible. Say again? It does say that it is his will that none shall perish. It doesn't say desire. Uh, yeah, it's not in the, in the original language, though. There is a discrepancy there. And so that's the, that's the kind of... The, when we get into territory where we start saying that, like, how do I say this? I believe that everything that happens is according to God's will, good and bad. Not caused by God. So hear me when I say that. God doesn't cause all things. But he, he wills things to happen. He allows, is another way of thinking about it, things to happen. The reason I think, it doesn't mean that he wants them to. He desires all men be saved, but he doesn't will them to be saved. Because if we say that, then what we're saying is that things are happening in the world outside of God's will and then he ceases to be God at that point. He's no longer a sovereign. So, so that gets into like kind of another topic or, or territory. But the point that I get from Jesus' ministry on the earth and the way, like for example, in Paul, uh, I think it's 2 Timothy, I, I can't remember, maybe 2 Thessalonians. It's one of the second books, I know that. He talks about how he was, he was uh, delayed like three days because the person he was staying with was sick. And that's a big problem in theological discussions regarding the spiritual gift of healing because if anyone had and possessed and demonstrated the ability to heal on demand, it was Paul. And yet he waits around for like three days for his buddy to get over whatever illness he has. And they were going to do ministry. So you could even make the case that like we're being prevented from doing what God wants us to do because you're throwing up or whatever. You would think that would be plenty case to heal, and yet he doesn't. And so my view of, of healing, apostolic healing specifically, in the manner that Jesus does, is not that it does, it does reflect the heart of God. Absolutely. It absolutely does. God desires that sin be eradicated. It wasn't a part of his plan. It wasn't how he designed us. But I think that those moments happen to demonstrate the new covenant is being established. This is what the kingdom of God is like. It is like this. It is, it is unlike the earth where people get sick and die, where people are born with malformities, where people have these issues. It is different than that. And when you come into the kingdom one day and you are with him and you become like him, then all of that is, is realized. There is no more sickness, death, so on and so forth. So, that's my position. That, I mean, that's how I, I see it squared in all of, in all of the New Testament. I, there are certainly people who have different opinions, different positions, convictions, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, I mean, that that that'd be something that you'd have to study, and and it sounds like you have to some degree. But, um, you know, that I I I get behind one hundred percent that God can do anything, anything. I believe God can raise the dead because he's demonstrated. I believe God can heal because I've seen it happen. I believe God can do. And so I want and I desire and I pray fervently in those situations. I don't doubt that he can do it. But I also recognize that I don't always understand the bigger picture. And I want to surrender myself to, it's kind of, it kind of gets back to this idea here, right? That, that I'm not just in love with you and I'm not just uh, a disciple of yours and, and doing this because you're going to do something for me. I love you even if you don't. It's the Daniel thing. That though, though he slay me, still I will praise him. 
And uh, I think that's a hard place to get to. And it's a, it's a fine line because you don't want to sound like, I don't know that God's going to do this. Or, you know, you don't want to sound doubtful. Um, I also don't want to sound presumptuous. So. Yeah, that, that kind of thing, it kind of places a Christian in a double-minded position. I'm going to pray for you to be healed. Does anyone have ever pray for somebody? I know your word is the truth. Mm-hmm. I thank you that you sent Jesus yeah. to heal us. And I am using my faith, acting on your word, and I lay my hands upon my brother or sister. Yeah. And I thank you that your power, your presence is here to heal. Mm-hmm. And so I try not to enter into that kind of place with any doubt or unbelief, because then I feel like I'm being doubled. <coughs> Yeah, I don't think it's a place of doubt. And, and, and the reason I say that is because how do you square him not healing? I think the people, they need to know, though, that the problem there I see is, is uh, then if, um, if, they don't, if they don't get healed, then I think it, they should know that it's still the will of God, that even if, even if they don't get healed. Because if, if they don't get healed... Yeah. then it's kind of like, well, why didn't you, you did that? Why didn't I get healed? Yeah. Well, and here's a good segue. Think about this. Pray, pray about this. We're going to come back next week into First Peter. We're going to talk about uh, near the end here, but we'll, I, I think we'll probably get to it. Um, what kind of healing is purchased for us in the atonement? That may help shape a little bit of our answers as well. First Peter 2, if you want to read ahead, that's where that's at. Yeah, I, I always think about Jesus praying in the garden of sin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because that is kind of a double-minded. There's two kinds of healing. There's spiritual healing. And the minute that we accept Christ and embrace the Lord's through faith, we're spiritually healed at that moment. Well, and Gethsemane is so an physical example. Physical healing, well, where I'm going with this is Jesus... Yeah, I think in his, and I'm in you well, basically, but I, I always have felt like in his humanity, at that point in time, he prayed for God, the Father, to take that cup away from him. Yeah. In his divinity, he knew what was coming, and he knew it was not going to be fun in his human, in his humanity, and he prayed for God to take that cup away from him. But then he said. Your will be done. Okay. And so that's that's where I always go to because I I've always felt uncomfortable asking for God to heal somebody physically because I don't want you know I, I don't want to come across and, and you know somebody be harmed because that healing didn't occur. But look, this is this is the way the body of Christ works, though. Um, Last thing I'll say, because I think this is really a, a, a great point to think about. Some, some people are uncomfortable praying for healing, just like full force. Some people are not. So like when I'm sick, I want you praying for me. <laughs> and, I, and I say that. I said, look, if any of the kind of attack, and any kind of infirmity tries to attack me, I want somebody with faith and yes. without, without wavering that believes God, trusts God for what His Word said, and let God do the rest. Yeah, right. You need to have faith. There are spiritual gifts of faith. There are spiritual gifts of healing. And I don't know how they work. They don't work like the apostles work, but I do know that the body is supposed to have a little bit of everything. So we got to identify the use. And like whenever y'all are sick, call Michelle, right? That's what I would say. <laughs> don't call Charlie, call Michelle. <laughs> All right, bless y'all. We'll see you next time. <laughs>